Jesus Christ set aside his Godhead. so stoked to get to teach this morning. We are going through Galatians with a deep dive. This will be our third lesson on it. I've got uh, this week, I will be teaching again next week, but uh, with current plans on February 14th, a day I love. Um, uh, I am likely going to be gone. That's the current plan, but... On February 14th when I'm gone, it looks like Pastor Jarrett will teach this class. Uh, that's the current plan, which is exciting. And for the, I say that, I mean, people here get to hear him. But for those of you who watch on the internet, uh, you may not have heard our new pastor. And so he'll be teaching as opposed to preaching, which is sometimes a little bit different process. And uh, he'll be teaching in the Galatians series. And I'm really excited that people on the internet may get a chance to meet uh, uh, virtually, uh, our new pastor, who I just think is uh, an incredible man of God, but also just a fun person. I really like him. Okay, so with that, let's get started. If you recall, lesson number one was a lesson about how the, the, the book of Galatians is a serious issue. Paul's not writing out of boredom. He's not writing out of uh, gee, I'd like to keep our relationship up. It wasn't a pen pal letter. There was something, there were matters that were serious. And Paul addressed those matters, recognizing that everybody needed to understand how serious it was. And then in the second lesson, I delved into this, talking about the power and the sanctity of the gospel. Now, gospel is a word that gets used so many different ways today, especially by people who are talking about the first four books of the New Testament. And those books are even labeled, if you read them, the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark. And that's fine, but those were written after Paul wrote his letters. And when Paul wrote his letters and he used the word gospel, he had something very specific in mind. And so we talked about that in lesson number two. And the core would be, this is a picture of a Greek-English lexicon. Lexicon comes from the Latin. It, it basically just means it's a dictionary. Uh, but, but when you're dealing with old dead languages, it sounds really cool to call it a lexicon instead of a dictionary. So... Uh, but, but this is a Greek-English lexicon, which means you're looking up the words in the Greek and it will give you the English. This is one of the most common ones out there. Uh, it was one that was a textbook of mine in college, but it was, um, it's not necessarily the best, so don't take this as an endorsement, but it's the most common, let's put it that way. If you look up the word gospel, and you'd have to be looking it up in its Greek form. Its Greek form is euangelion. If you look, or euangelios, if you look up the Greek word for gospel, the very first definition is God's good news to humans. Or good news. Now, that's an easy word to get because the Greek here is that's an E and a U, an epsilon and an upsilon. E-U means good. And we've got that word still with us in the English language. Euthanasia is a good death, literally. That's, I'm not saying it is, but that's what it's translated to be. Okay, Euphemism. A good way to say something that might be a little naughty otherwise. Okay? You means good. E-U. And then this next word is A-G-G. -G, alpha, gamma, gamma. Now, Greek is a weird language in that 
when you put two G's together, you pronounce it in G. So if you wanted to say angle in Greek, instead of A-N-G, you would say A-G-G. Two G's together is an N-G sound. So this is angel. Angel. Message. An angel is a messenger. Because it's that word. It's angelo. So this is a good E-U message. That's what gospel means if you break the word down. But for Paul, when he used that word, he wasn't talking about just any good news. He's talking about something very specific. Ava, if I had you draw a picture of what G Paul meant when he said gospel, your picture would look like something close to that. Because when the good news, the great news, the news that outweighs all other news for Paul was that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he was resurrected and those who are in him by faith will be resurrected with him. We will live eternally. I've got a dear friend, a mentor of mine. Uh, in fact, he was my preacher growing up. He's the one who talked me into going to law school over taking a job as a preacher. And, and we've stayed close ever since. So that's 40 years ago. And he's in ICU right now with COVID. And, and, and I, I hope and pray that, that he survives this. But there's one thing he and I know as we text each other back and forth. And that is that we have a confident expectation as people who have trusted in Christ that just as he died for our sins and was resurrected, we will be found in him and we will share in his resurrection. That's great news. And that's the good news for Paul. The good news is not simply, uh, hey, you can go to church. The good news is not simply, let me tell you about Christmas story and how Jesus was born. The gospel, the good news for Paul is Christ died for our sins and he was resurrected and those of us who put our faith in him will be resurrected with him. That's great news. So within the framework of that, we reach our class today, lesson number three, and this I'm calling the authentic gospel. The authentic gospel. All right? Here we go. Let's start with this. You did your hair different. <laughs> Auto. Hey, I'm, I'm just standing up here looking, okay? Autobiography. We know that word, don't we? It's a composite of three different words. Auto means self. Something automatic, it does it by itself. Bio, Greek word bios for life. Biology, it's a study of life. Auto, self, life, and graph, writing. Autobiography, it's what you write about yourself or you write about your own life, okay? The passage that we're looking at today is part of what we could call the autobiographical section of Galatians. This is where Paul writes a little autobiography. And here's the bizarre part. If you do the math, almost 20% of Galatians is autobiographical. I mean like one out of every five verses if you put it all together and do the math. That's a whole lot of writing about oneself in a book that's supposed to be about theology. So if you and I were going to write our autobiography, what would be the title? 
I mean, what, what do you learn? Lawyer gone rogue. I don't know. What would be the title of your autobiography? Older twin to my sister. Who knows? Oliver, it could be yours. Ava, my parents finally got it right. <laughs> Miss Carolyn, what would your autobiography be titled? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Whoa! Miss Carolyn did not say that. She's got enough humility. It was, it was next to her that that was echoed out there. Okay. Diane's uh, autobiography, what would it, you title it? Probably, I'm with him. <laughs> or he's with me, even better. So, Paul's. I don't know what it would be, but if I were going to title the 20% of this letter that's autobiographical, I would entitle it for Paul, Changed by God and the True Gospel. That's a pretty good title to a book. I wouldn't mind that one. Catherine, you remember when you were changed by God and the True Gospel? Do you remember that? If it's never been your story, let's talk because it should be. Pay attention to this class. If you're on the internet, it's never been your story, email me. I'm, you can Google, how do I email Mark Lanier? And it should come up. I would be honored to talk to you. But when I say Paul, changed by God and the true gospel, what do I mean by true gospel? Gospel, you say. Oh, that's God. Good, it's good news. But specifically for Paul, Christ died for our sins, was resurrected as will be those with him. Paul's changed by that truth, by God and the true gospel. So let's look at his autobiographical section that we're looking at today. We'll finish that next week. And here are the three questions around class today. Question number one. Paul, where did you get your gospel? The gospel, what does he mean by gospel? Not just good news, but what's the good news? Christ died for our sins. You're going to see this slide ten times today. Don't forget it. You see the word gospel? I want you to immediately think of the cross of Christ. If Paul's writing... Think of it. So, first question. Where did you get your gospel? Knowing what the gospel is, let's look at the passage. Paul says, I would have you know, I'm in chapter 1, verse 11. I would have you know, brethren, and, and the, uh, Adelphos, the word for, for brethren there, uh, is in the form of Delphoi, but uh, uh, doesn't, it, don't, don't get think Paul's being sexist. That was the generic word for brothers and sisters, okay? In fact, Paul will say in this letter that there's no difference in Jesus between male or female. So um, don't, don't get wrapped up and think Paul's all goofy on that. He wants everyone to know, not just the brethren, but the sistren. I would have you know, brethren and sistren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now let's start out with that, I would have you know. Gnorizo gar hemen. Gnorizo is the verb. Gnorizo, uh, gnosis is the knowledge. And, and gignosko is the general verb for no. But when it takes this form, gnorizo, it means something a little bit different. So we'll pull back up our dictionary. Gnorizo, to cause information to become known. To make known. To reveal it. So the translators translate that, I would have you know, that is Paul causing information to become known. I want you to know. 
I want to make it known to you. I want to reveal to you. Let me give you another passage to show you how Paul uses this word. It's his letter to the Colossians, Colossians 1.27. Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians 1.27. Paul says, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But he chose to make it known. And that to make known is the same word. That's what Paul is saying here. You know, Rizzo means to make it known. I want it made known. I want you to know. I'm going to teach it as clearly as I can. He's saying, think this through. Think about this. I love this. I love this on 30 different levels. I love this because this tells me that the gospel and faith is not for the mentally lazy. He does not say, close your eyes and leap off into the abyss of faith. Faith is not an abyss. It's something that's based on knowledge, gnosis. It's something you're to know. Gignosco. It's something you, he wants to make known to you. Gnorizzo. This is, this is knowledge. This is not fiction. This isn't something you blindly embrace. I'm not a Christian because I hope it's right. I'm a Christian because it makes the most sense to me of who I am, who you are, and what's going on in this crazy wackadoodle world where we live. It makes sense to me, and it's a coherent truth. And we live where there's a whole generation of people who are growing up or who are in their 20s and 30s who don't believe in a real truth out there. It's kind of like everybody has their own truth. You decide what you want to believe. It's as good as what he believes or she believes or I believe or anyone. And, and, and it's just, hey, let's don't judge people. And, and look, I'm all for us loving and encouraging and accepting people, but not saying that there's not truth there is truth and it does make a difference so if we look this up in our trusty dictionary I would want to go to gospel God's good news to humans and what is it when Paul uses it it's that Christ died for our sins, was resurrected, as will be those who are in him. This is not an opinion. This is something to think about and to know. And Paul wants you to know it. Experience it. Believe it. I want you to know brethren, the gospel which was preached by me. The gospel which, look at this. In the Greek, I told you gospel is the word euangelion. Here it is. E-U, which is good, like euphemism or whatever. And then A-G-G, which sounds like A-N-G, like angel. There it is. I want you to know, brethren, the gospel, and then it says to and look at that third word I've got in the, in the red there. Do you see it? It looks very much like gospel, doesn't it? It's got that same E-U-A, the G-G-E-L-I. It's just got the four letters at the end are different. Because it's not a noun, it's a verb. 
And it's translated preached. But what it really means is the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which I proclaim to you as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The gospel that I gospeled you. The good news that I newsed goodly to you. The good message that I messaged good to you. What was that message, Paul? Oh, you want us to look in the dictionary? It's God's good news. And when you say the good news is Christ died for our sins, was resurrected, as will be those in him. He says, when I told you that, this is not a message that was given to me according to man. This is not kata anthropon, handed down. Kata means down, and, and it can be translated according to because it's the sense of, here, let me hand this down to you. The gospel was not handed down from some man to Paul. Paul didn't get it at life group. He didn't get it at church. Paul got the gospel from something greater than humanity. This is why Paul says, I want to make it known to you, this is something that's a real truth. It's not an arbitrary truth. This is fact. So, Paul can write about it as the gospel of God. And he'll call it the gospel of God, 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Look, let's uh, throw it up here. And what we're going to do afterwards is I'm going to ask Ava again what he means by gospel in this passage. So get ready, Ava. 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Paul says, We being a affectionately desirous of you we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God but also our own selves now what does he mean when he uses the word what does Paul mean when Paul uses the word gospel death and resurrection very good Ava we wanted to share with you the death and resurrection of Christ on your behalf but he calls it here the gospel of God because God is the author of the gospel. But he can also call it, in the same book, the gospel of Christ. Because Christ is the subject matter of the gospel. And so if we look at chapter 3, verse 2, which on my Bible that I've got up here is on the exact same page, just a little bit further down. Paul says, we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. So we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel. What does he mean by gospel? The death and resurrection of Christ on our behalf. He says, we sent Timothy in that gospel to, to proclaim that gospel. To establish you in your faith so that your faith is in the death and resurrection of Christ on your behalf. Paul can talk about the gospel of God because God is the author. The gospel of Christ where it's a, a, an objective genitive is what it would be called in Greek class. Because Christ is... The subject matter. Now Paul's point here is that these are real historical events. We should not get lost in the fact that this happened 2,000 years ago and think that it's made up. It's, and, and when Paul's writing this in the 40s, he's 15 years or so out from the real events. And he's writing this because this really happened. 
This is not fake news. This is fact. And he wants them to understand that because people had come into the church after him and had said, yeah, Paul, bless his heart. He was a little mixed up. You know, Paul, he, did, he wasn't really one of Jesus' initial followers. And so Paul, you know, he's getting it from someone else who's getting it from someone else. And Paul just doesn't have it quite right. So let us tell you how it should be. And that's what Paul's combating here. And that's why, if you recall, the verses before this, Paul said, if anybody, even if we come in, I come in and preach a gospel contrary to the one you've received. Gospel means what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on our behalf. If someone tries to give you a good news that's not that, let him be cursed. Because that's the real news. And he says, and I, this is not something I may have gotten wrong when I was in life group. I neither received it from man, I wasn't taught it from men. And what Paul's doing here is establishing the credibility of his message of the gospel. It's so important to him that people understand this wasn't some human, and Paul's not a second generation human teacher he's delivering what he got from Jesus and God so when Paul talks about the fact that God's good news is the death of Christ for our sins he's talking about something that did not come from a human being I neither received it from men Para labon, auto. I didn't receive it from men. This isn't something that men threw me like a football. This is not something that I got it because Max gave it to me. And Max got it because someone else gave it to them. And someone else gave it to them. And someone else gave it to them. I want to tell you something. I'm sharing with you the gospel. I received it by the Holy Spirit. Through the teachings of Paul. But Paul got it from the Lord. So, you know, if we're all within seven identification marks of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> you all know that, right? Everybody in here is within seven people. You know someone who knows someone. Who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows Kevin Bacon? That's just true for everybody. We're only, all of us, only seven degrees of people from Kevin Bacon. On this, one, two, two degrees. We are reading a letter from someone who got it from God Himself. And what Paul wants is he wants everybody to understand. He didn't receive it from men. He wasn't taught it by men. This is not a he said, she said gospel. This is not a gospel where we can say, well, that's one version of the truth and here's another version of the truth. No. If Paul's being honest, if Paul is right, then we are getting firsthand the very first person who received it from God. We're reading Paul's words. Janet's in the back. Janet's got, look, Janet, can I have the Dr. Floyd Bible? We have got right here the writings of the Apostle Paul. And you can find the scholars who find, you can, you, I can show you atheistic scholars that don't even believe in a God. They don't believe the Bible is worthy of the title Bible. They don't believe that Scripture is inspired. But they will not dispute that Paul wrote Galatians. And that we've really got 98% confidence this is the exact text. And the only place there's a question is, did he insert the word God there or not in a couple of places? Or did the later church insert that? But it makes no difference to the read. There's no question. This is what Paul said. This is Paul's 
words. This is not a he said, she said gospel. We are getting straight from the source God's good news, which is Christ died for our sins, was resurrected, as will be those who put their trust in him. And Paul says, didn't get it from a man, didn't, wasn't taught it from a man. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation, apocalypsios. Apocalypsios. What does that sound like? Apocalypsios. Apocalyptic. Apocalypse. It's the word translated revelation. In the book of Revelation. That is an apocalypsis. That is a revelation. Paul says, I got it revealed to me. It was revealed dia Jesu Christu through. This is Allah, but dia through the revelation, Jesus Christ. I received it through Jesus Christ. The gospel was a revelation of Jesus. You want the story? You can get it in different places, but Acts 9 is a pretty good one. Look at Acts chapter 9 with me for a moment. I think we've got time to actually read through some of it and not just me tell it. So let's see if we can't do that. Maybe. There we go. Acts 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. By the way. If you've been in my classes long, you know that I've said this before, but I want to say it again because people sometimes forget. Saul and Paul are the same guy. He did not change his name after he encountered Jesus. He wasn't Saul before, and then he encounters Jesus and becomes a believer and changed his name to Paul. No. Saul was Jewish, and Saul is a Jewish name. The first king of Israel was named Shaul, Saul. Paul was also a Roman citizen and was required to have a Roman, actually three Roman names. And his Roman name was Paulos. So when Paul's out in the Roman world... He goes by his Roman name, Paulos, which, by the way, is Latin for shorty. <laughs> so when he's out on the mission field, he's shorty. But when he's in the midst of his Judaism, he's Shaul. Shaul. That's his, uh, here, Sha. That's an SH sound in Hebrew. Shaul. Um, I think it may just be, my Hebrew spelling is pretty poor. I think it's just the Shaul, but it's possible it's got a, an Aleph in there. So somebody who's going to email me and say I messed up on the Hebrew, I can't spell half of the English words I use. So cut me some slack. But the bottom line is Shaul. Yeah, so it's going to have to have that Aleph in there. Anyway, Shaul is his. Hebrew name. You say, well, then why doesn't it say Shaul? Because the Greeks didn't have an SH sound. They couldn't have even pronounced his name. He gets out in the Greek world and they're like, how, how do you say it? They don't have a sh sound in Greek. So they just do S, sa. So Shaul becomes Saul. <laughs> Saul, we read it. But it's the same guy, okay? So now let's get back to it. So here's Shaul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He's no friend to the resurrection of Jesus. He goes to the high priest and says, give me some letters addressed to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if I find any who belong to the way. That's what they called Christianity at the time. 
because Jesus said, I am the way. And these Jesus freaks thought that Jesus was the way to God. And Paul, as a good Pharisee, thinks the way to God is through the law. Any belonging to the way, men or women, so I can arrest them, put handcuffs on them, and bring them to Jerusalem. Now, as Paul went on his way, which means he got the papers, he was a prosecuting attorney. He approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice that knew how to pronounce his name. Shaul! Shaul! Why are you persecuting me? And Paul said, uh, who, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. Paul sees the risen Jesus. Paul has an experience, an encounter, a factual occurrence. And it's not a dream. And it's not make-believe. And it's not a false apparition. And it's not magic work. Rise and enter the city and you'll be told what you're to do. Now the men who were traveling with them stood speechless because they heard the voice. They just didn't see Jesus. But they heard it. This was not a LSD trip he was on. He hadn't hit the peyote, peyote, whatever it's called, on the way there. What mushrooms he'd had for lunch. Seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. Now he opened his eyes and he saw nothing. He was blinded. So they had to lead him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he couldn't see. He didn't eat or drink. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to Ananias in a vision. Came, said to him in a vision, Ananias. And Ananias said, yo, here I am. And God said, rise and go to the street called Straight. By the way, that street, you can find pictures of it that are 150 years old because the street called Straight in Damascus has been around since then. It certainly was there when Luke's writing Acts. And people could go check this out if they wanted to. At the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Shaul. He's praying. And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so he could regain his sight. But Ananias said, um, God, maybe an internet rumor, but I've heard about this fella. How much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And he's actually here with authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said, uh, I'm, I'm up on the news. I got this. I want you to go. He's a chosen instrument of mine. He's going to carry my name before the Gentiles and before kings as well as the children of Israel. And I'm going to show him how much he has to suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed, he entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Shaul, the Messiah Jesus, no, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, appeared to you on the road, by which you came, sent me, so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. He rose. He was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Now look at this. He didn't go to seminary. 
He didn't get books by C.S. Lewis. He didn't listen to the podcast of our class. He was with the disciples for some days and immediately he was proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues saying he's the son of God. Immediately. And everyone who heard him was amazed and said, isn't this that Yehu who was making havoc in Jerusalem of those who call on his name? And didn't he come here for this purpose to tie him up and Arrest them and take them to the chief priest. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving Yeshua was the Messiah. This is what Paul does. And it gets so bad that the Jews plotted to kill him. And he starts on the run. And Paul had a revelation of Jesus. Paul understood firsthand, immediately, not from a human, that Jesus was resurrected. And that's good news. Jesus the Messiah. So question, where did you get your gospel? Paul got his from Jesus. You read Paul and you're getting it one step removed. You find Kevin Bacon you can share it with him and he can go to Paul one step removed. Second question, what completely changed Paul? Because Paul was completely changed. If you go back, Paul says, those of you who heard of my former life, I persecuted the church of God violently. I tried to destroy it. And I was head and shoulders above anybody else my age. I was voted most likely to succeed at killing the church. I was voted most popular by the chief priests. I was so zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But verse 15, when he who set me apart before I was born... And called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. His life changed. You know, so why was Paul willing to totally burn down his incredible life? Do you understand he was a citizen of Tarsus? Tarsus was a city in what's now Turkey. If you were going to be a Tarsian citizen, it cost big buccaronis. Which means Paul came from a family of big buccaronis. They had lots of do re me. They had ka in the bank. They had enough to take their, prod- their, their son, their little shorty that they were so proud of and send shorty to Jerusalem and they had enough political connections and enough money to where shorty got to study under Gamaliel who took one student at a time. Because he was the most successful rabbi living in Judaism. We still today have writings of Paul's mentor, Gamaliel. He was a big deal. And Paul had the connections. And Paul, this man on the fast track to success, this man who's got all of the power of of the aristocracy of Judaism behind him. This man with the money, this man with the zeal, the passion, the intellect. This man does a 180, bam, immediately, that burns down an incredible life. Now why? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons. One, maybe he was just a nutter. Few bricks shy of a load. Didn't have all the biscuits in the oven. We have those expressions for people who aren't altogether there functioning. And they're funny, but I don't mean to make light of them. There are people who have serious mental issues that don't function normally. I've, I've got people like that that are dear to me in my life. I've represented a boatload of people 
or I've known and been friends with a boatload of people who have serious mental health issues. Was Paul one of them? No. I mean, how do I know that? I've read everything he wrote many times. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and you tell me that that's written by someone who's just has no grasp of reality, who's so, I'm not talking about someone who's depressed. I'm not talking about some, when I say a nutter, I'm not talking about someone who's, you know, manic up and down. I'm talking about someone who has lost grip of reality. Did Paul lose grip of reality? No. The, the man who wrote, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. It doesn't envy, doesn't boast. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, never ends. The man who wrote that is not an unfunctioning fella who has no grasp of reality. Read the entire book of Romans where he basically quotes in modern sense almost all of Isaiah and the Psalms and he makes these cogent, intelligent arguments from Scripture worthy of the greatest intellect of his day. He's not out of touch with reality. Look at his other letters. There's not a shred of anything that indicates he's out of touch with reality. I don't see anyone who can realistically try to argue. Paul believed that and totally burned down his life because he just didn't have enough reality in his life to function. Okay, so why else? Maybe did he just get it wrong? Was he just mistaken? Was he just having a bad day? Was it something he ate? Well, no, not if there are scales in his eyes and blindness and the scales have to remove. He has a very real experience. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is one of Ava's favorite verses because it's where he tells what the gospel is. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. What's that, Ava? That's exactly right. Jesus Christ, dead and resurrected. I preach to you by which you're being saved. I delivered to you. Here it is, the gospel. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then look what Paul says after that. He says, you wonder about it? He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the twelve. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, like someone untimely born, he also appealed to, appeared to me. I mean, Paul's not just like saying, hey, this happened. He's giving references. He's not the only voice out there saying it. There are hundreds of people who witnessed the resurrected Jesus people could go check with. Paul's not wrong. He's not worried about being wrong. Look at what he says in Acts 21, 30 and following. This is, this is massive. Acts 21, 30 and following. Twenty-one, thirty, 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 thirty. 30, 30, 30. All the city is stirred up. All the people run together. They seize Paul. They drag him out of the temple. The gates are shut. And they're seeking to kill him. Word comes to the tribune that everything's in confusion. And they all run down. And they stop beating Paul because they see the soldiers. The soldiers come up and arrest him. They order him to be bound with chains. He's carried away. There's mob violence. They conspire to kill him. You know, if I got something wrong, 
And I realized it, and I just kind of got out on a limb, and so, you know, this is the way I'm going, this is my path now. And, and then someone's going to kill me over it? I'd be willing to say, you know, on second thought, that could have been the mushrooms. <laughs> but not Paul. I mean, in 2 Corinthians 11.24, I mean, yeah, it's 11.24. 2 Corinthians 11.24. Listen to what Paul was willing to endure because of the gospel. 11.24. Mm, get up there, get up there, get up there. This, ah, 11.24. Okay. 11.24. Five times I received 40 lashes less than one. That's 39 lashes. That tears to the bone. Five times. He's had them tie him up between pillars and whip him 39 times. That not only tears the skin, but it tears through the muscle and it tears to the bone. Three times he's beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. A night and a day he was adrift at sea. In frequent journeys, he was in danger from rivers, dangers from rogers, robbers, dangers from his own people, from the Gentiles in the city, in the wilderness, at sea, from false brothers, many a sleepless night, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and exposed. If he'd gotten it wrong, why does he hold on to it? Don't you know for the rest of his life, he'd have been saying, could I have just missed something? But he's willing to have his entire life raised. Not because he was wrong, not because he was a nut, but because the gospel was real. This is what happened to him. It was real. He had an undeniable, real encounter with the risen Jesus. And for that, he said to the Philippians, he was willing to count everything that was good and valuable and important in his life as garbage in the dumpster compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection and sharing in it. And that's what he says. He says, when he who set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, this was the revelation he got. This is what he said in 2 Corinthians 12.10. He says, look, when you've had this encounter with Christ, for the sake of Christ, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. Doesn't bother me. I know Jesus. I know the reality of this. And so it's that Philippians passage. I was just telling you the Philippians 3, 4 through 11. In the interest of time, I was going through it quickly in my head. But look at it. He says, I was all of these incredible things. You know, I was circumcised the eighth day. People of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, zealous, persecutor of the church, righteous under the law, blameless. But every gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I suffered the loss of all things. Count them like garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from a law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, so that by any means possible, I'll attain the resurrection from the dead. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what Paul had. That's what Paul wrote about over and over and over. And I'll leave those passages aside. But suffice it to say, that's why Paul was willing to burn down his life, because of the gospel. What completely changed Paul? A true encounter with Jesus. And then the final question, which I'm going to do right now in one minute. Does the God who calls equip? Absolutely. 
when he who set me apart was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I didn't consult with anyone. I didn't go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. God was his teacher. He was set apart and God was pleased. Eudoke sin. He was pleased to reveal his son. Now I've got to go but I've got to show you this picture which was posted by our daughter. That's our daughter Gracie. That's our son-in-law JT. And that's our grandson John Henry with a big bro shirt because Gracie has two little twin girls in her belly right now growing. And they understood how pleased they were to get to post that and tell people about it. And those children are, those two twin girls are already in the womb. They're halfway done. But it makes me know how God is pleased to call you from the womb because you're his child. He wants to post it on social media. I don't think he's a fan of Facebook. But he wants to post it on, he wants everyone. It's pleasing to him. And Paul says, he was pleased to call me from my mother's womb. God, does he equip those? Yes, this is called a Hena purpose clause in Greek. He was, it was in order that I might preach him. He had purpose behind calling Paul. And the purpose of life is a life of purpose. And the purpose of Paul's life was built around the good news, the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for our sins. So does the God who calls equip? Absolutely. Duh. Of course, he's pleased to. Every one of us, everyone watching this, God is pleased to call you from the womb. It doesn't matter what you did. The worse you've been, the greater his glory for forgiving you your sins. Where'd you get your gospel? Paul got his from Jesus, so let's tune into it. Who completely changed Paul? A true encounter with Jesus, so let's trust in it. Does God equip the ones he calls? Of course. So let's live by the gospel. Let us proclaim it and let us know it is authentic. And with that, we can go to church. Can I bless you? Father, in the name of Jesus, by the great news of his death, burial, and resurrection, we trust you. We trust you for that. We want to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of our own based on who we are or how we see the world, but one that's based entirely upon Christ, our righteousness, our richest gain. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. See you guys next Sunday.